You know, having uh, to talk uh, right after Ralph Raker, who's such a great speaker, I'm a little bit nervous, you know, because I'm, I'm not a great speaker. But I'm going to be talking to you about uh, natural rights, and I'll make the case for natural law and natural rights in a very subtle manner, supposedly. I'll try to make this. You know, I'll just, uh, I won't push it. I won't be a fanatic at all. <laughs> I'll just uh, say a few things that at the end of uh, at least four hours, because I'm going to talk, you know, today about the natural law tradition in antiquity in the Middle Ages. Then I'll be talking about the birth of economic science. And since I'm not an economist, I'll be talking again about natural rights, <laughs> that tradition. So <clears throat> the third lecture will be on natural rights. And supposedly, I'll be talking about natural rights. And the end, I'll be talking about the anti-federalist tradition until the Civil War, which could be defendant on natural rights ground. And I'll do exactly that. So, you know, just don't jump at me because uh, we'll, we'll have time to discuss all the issues about natural rights and natural law. And I do know that a lot of uh, libertarians do not agree with this view. And uh, they, like um, my friend Don Livingstone, I mean, he's a great scholar. I admire him very much, but he doesn't think much of natural rights. I'm not going to try to convince him this time, but uh, eventually, you know, in due time, I will. And uh, I just do not believe that libertarianism can be defended only on natural rights ground. I just think it's a better way to defend it. It's, uh, it's different. It's very forceful. So, actually, when we talk about natural law, we talk about one of the oldest and um, the most discussed and most frequently used concepts of political theory. At least, I mean, it went into oblivion for about a century or so, but now it's, it's in vogue because of a guy named Robert Nozick, oddly enough. And um, I will entertain you, as I said, for about three or four hours on this topic, so dwelling on this concept and its history. So we better start with some very broad uh, distinctions and generalizations, very general things. And if, if you do not understand anything, it means I'm mispronouncing it, you know, because it's very simple. It's got to be very simple. If you do understand everything, and uh, just congratulate yourself. And uh, it doesn't mean I'm being just too basic. I mean, it means you know a lot. So, like, in general law, uh, in natural law, concepts have assumed two forms. Now, one is the rules which are statements of the basic laws of the universe or of man's constitution or of social and political relationships. This is a very general meaning. And the second one, the most interesting one, actually, is the principles of what is right and the principles which are to be established if justice is to prevail. So it's very close and linked to the theory of justice, not John Rowell's one, I mean, but a different one. Just, um, so, in other words, natural law carries two meanings. It is a term indicating either the scientific laws of man and his environment or the laws which should exist. The two meanings are usually very much related. As most thinkers derive from the observation of nature of man, certain laws that should be established. Once again, if justice is to prevail. And... The doctrine of natural law was a major theme in the Western political thought from the 5th century before Christ until at least the end of the 18th century. And then I guess there, there's a new interest right now going on in the past 30 years, but, but there was a great decline at the beginning of the 19th century. So as a moral philosophy, it played a central role in three important <laughs> historical events the extension of the influence of the Roman civilization and law over Western Europe. That was a key thing. And then the fusion of Christianity and classical culture during the Middle Ages. And the emergence of classical liberalism from the 16th to the 18th century, which was definitely based on natural rights theory. So every great moment in the history of the West was marked by a peculiar interpretation of natural law. And actually, it was the irrelevance of the natural law doctrine in the 20th century that must be considered at least one of the causes of the success of totalitarianism, hard and soft versions of it. When I say hard totalitarianism, it means it attacks the lives and properties of the people. It's soft when it attacks only the properties. So we're living under what I would call soft totalitarianism. 
And the criminal utopians and social planners of the past century had a great advantage in finding individuals that believed that they had no rights based on their very nature of human beings. It was a great advantage for them, at least in my point of view. But in general, the theory of natural law, as the words immediately suggest, has been used to provide a universal, rational standard to determine the nature and the limits of political obligation and the evaluation of competing forms of government also, and also the relation of law and politics to morals. This is supposed to be very unscientific. I mean, if you want something scientific, you've you got to sever, sever everything from morals. You know, that's, uh, but actually, natural law is not supposed to be scientific because it's very closely related to morals. So the real quest that is behind almost every natural law doctrine is the quest for a political order firmly rooted in reason, in our moral understanding of it, or in the universe, in man, as opposed to a political order based on the will or of the strongest, of the best organized, which is usually what they call themselves the state. So that's, that's really the quest of many natural law doctrine, you know, the quest for something objectively rooted somewhere else from the will of man. So in this sense, the very opposite of natural law is the current view that laws are what the legislatures, as representative of the people, of course, want them to be. So it's uh, law is whatever the sovereign says it is. So in most doctrines of natural law, we can find the belief that there exists in nature and or human nature a rational order which can provide intelligible value statements independently of human will that are universal in application, unchangeable in their ultimate content, and morally mandatory on mankind. I'm sorry, humankind. (laughs) With these generalizations, we can begin our discussion of natural law and history. So a very good good starting point is uh, Sophocles' Antigone. Now, Antigone, as most of you probably remember, was a woman whose brother, Polynices, had attacked the city of Thebes. And he was formerly a citizen of Thebes, so that was treason. And, and had been killed in, killed in battle, and he lost. So, that victus, you know. For, for his treason, the tyrant Creon ordered that his body left to rot outside the gates, unburied and unmourned. And that was, you know, the law. And Antigone defied the tyrant's decree and buried her brother. And uh, so she was brought before um, Creon, and she declared that a law made by a mere man could not override the gods' unwritten and unfailing laws, which had existed longer than anyone could say. And uh, the passage is great, because, let me read it to you, because it's really like the first appearance of clear doctrine of natural law. So... Creon is trying trying to be kind of polite at the beginning. He says, now tell me, Antigone, straight yes or no. Did you know an edict had forbidden this? And she says, of course I knew. Was it not publicly proclaimed? So you chose flagrantry to disobey my law. Naturally, since God never promulgated such a law. She she was was a very, very, very courageous and brave woman. It says, nor will you find that justice, mistress of the world below, publishes such laws to humankind. She was totally PC. I never thought your mortal edicts had such force they nullified the laws of heaven, which unwritten, not proclaimed, can boast a currency that everlasting is valid, in origin beyond the birth of man. So that this is like... I'm sorry I read it to you in English, I could have read it in in Greek, but but it's very interesting because it's like the first instance of a natural right doctrine. And it doesn't come from a philosopher. It comes from a person who used to write plays that um, enjoyed, I mean, the people really enjoyed. So, however, it was up to the greatest philosophers of all time, the greatest philosopher of all times, actually, to, to render natural law the central theme of political philosophy. And, of course, I'm talking about Aristotle. And so many books, you know, and conflicting interpretations of, of Aristotle came out that I'll give you 
a very simple one, and it's very simple because it's mine, and it's, but it's correct, so don't, don't, don't bother. I, you know, as Wittgenstein said, simplex sigillum veri. Simplicity means it's true, you know, so when you see something very, too, too much complex, uh, well, either you read it again a couple of times, but then it might not be true. Now, uh, he wrote The Politics, or Politics, in uh, uh, 340, 330 before Christ, it's never been dated. And this is pretty much uncontroversial. And um, the focus of his political thought is actually the polis, what we now call the city-state, but it should, should be called uh, the free state or the political community, as there was no state, there was no sovereignty, there was nothing like that in ancient times, and not even in medieval times. I mean, sometimes we use the state as a genetic concept to convey certain ideas, but the state is only modern. So politics for, um, is the science of polis, of the polis, of this, well, we should call it the free state, the free city, of this free city. So the two doctrines that Aristotle defends are that human beings are political animals, zon politikon, and that polis exists by nature. That, uh, so the natural condition is for men and for political animals to be in the polis, which plural is polis. All right, just, just in case. Now, these claims presuppose that the polis is a community in which individuals must cooperate in order to attain self-sufficiency and thereby lead what he called the good life, which was a, was a very important concept for all Greek thinkers. So this is a very classic theme, you know, the good life or all ancient thought. The idea of leading a good life, and no political thinker ever thought that this could be attained outside of the policy, of the polis. So the political community was really, like, very important for the people. It was to be outcast from the political community was tantamount to be dead. It was pretty much the same thing for a lot of people. So according to Aristotle, politics is intended to provide guidance to politicians and lawgivers, as it is a practical science. It's not a theoretical science. And again, it's a science of the polis. And the politicians should bring the polis into a natural condition or maintain it in such a condition. So the important thing is that the polis must be in a natural condition, and we'll see in a, in a minute what it means. And uh, he calls this, uh, what the politicians should do with the, with the polis, the polis of our prayers. You know, the, the polis of our prayers is the polis that is in a natural condition. And a polis is in a natural condition when it aims at justice. A justice on one side and the common advantage on the other. So the basic problem of politics is actually a dispute over who in the polis has a just claim or right to be a citizen, and over what rights the citizens should have. Now, I'm talking about rights in ancient Greece, rights in the political discourse of Aristotle, and a lot of people would not agree. Some scholars would disagree because they believe that rights talk is the byproduct or of modernity, in a certain sense. It's a byproduct of classical liberalism, and um, it couldn't be used by the ancients. But you'll have to trust me on this. Actually, Aristotle is talking about rights. And all individual rights are based on justice and nature. He calls them claims. But as a citizen on the part of the polis, you do have claims against the polis. But he's actually talking about rights. But the real difference between modern natural rights theories and Aristotle's doctrine is that the Greek philosopher would never conceive individuals in a state of nature in which they already possess a set of natural rights. To him, as I said, the policy is a natural existing phenomenon, which may be in a natural or unnatural condition. And when the policy is in a natural condition, it is governed according to justice, also natural, and its citizens possess rights based on nature, again. So it's all natural, the polis, the citizens, their rights, and everything else. The real difference between modern rights talk is that he never thought there could exist individuals in the state of nature. 
He never thought of the state of nature without a polis. Actually, he thought the state of nature was a polis in a natural state. So, <coughs> so when the polis is in a natural condition, it is governed according to justice. And in this sense, we may view Aristotle as an ancestor of the natural rights tradition, but in a very qualified sense. And all these rights are actually claimed by individuals as member of the policy, of the polis, as, as a cooperative association. And of course, there's a clear difference between him and the modern thinkers. But I would say that individuality plays a crucial role in his political philosophy as well. And this becomes very clear if we analyze his view of property and of property rights. Aristotle goes to a full vindication of the right of private property in the second book of The Politics. Taken, and then he talks about pro property rights uh, all over his works, actually. But, and he takes a clear stand against Plato and Socrates who believe that children, women, and property ought to be common. Who believe in the community of women. Not a bad idea, but... <laughs> but, anyway... Especially when you're young, I mean, you're uh, in college, I mean, you get excited about it. But <laughs> then you grow up. And um, there are several arguments that he employs to defend the legitimacy of private property, and I'm not going to go through that, otherwise I, I wouldn't have time to talk about anything else. But uh, they it range, you know, from utilitarian arguments, instrumentality, and um, from uh, the eudaimonistic argument, which is uh, based on happiness, you know, the idea that the property brings happiness, uh, and so on, and all sorts of justifications for property. Uh, but uh, one must know that Aristotle discusses three schemes of property, which is pri private property, common use. And that's the one he prefers, he favors. And then is a common property, private use. And the third one is common property, common use. Now, there's one missing, isn't there? <laughs> it's the one I favor and the one most of us favor. So it's, uh, he leaves out private property, private use. And it's um, certainly the one that uh, most of us would prefer. However you've got to remember that Aristotle had anticipated the noted tragedy of the commons. As he points out, that I cannot feel for the community's resources what I feel for myself and my own things. As the polity, or the polis, in his thought, is prior to the individual, clearly private property can be regulated by the polis. However, it must be owned privately, never in common. Moreover, he criticizes confiscation by democratic, major democratic majorities of the property of the wealthy citizens and explicitly rejects the conventionalist argument that whatever law the majority decides to enact is just, objecting that confiscation in, is unjust, even if the majority supports it. You know, that's, um, that is what we could consider a classical liberal statement coming uh, from uh, more than 2,000 years ago. And thus, the property owner has a claim of justice. Now, a claim of justice in uh, Aristotle's stock would be very similar to what we might call a right. And a, plus, a claim of justice is definitely based on, based on nature. <coughs> and it's got, so it's got a right against other citizens, which is violated by the law of confiscation. And the best constitution, in his opinion, is actually the one that respects the property of the citizens. In this sense, I consider him very, very modern. But the theory that there is a law which is above the power of man to alter found his best defender in the Roman world. And this defender was Cicero. He clearly stated a lot of things that were to become like common knowledge in this tradition of thought. Sorry, I'm a great drinker of water in the morning. And uh, <coughs> so actually Cicero's discussion of the nature of the law is probably the best we find in, in antiquity. And it was the one that went through 
in scholastic times as well, and it went on, because Cicero was a Stoic. I mean, he was a follower of the Stoic tradition. And so he used to, to use the word God instead of gods several times. So it's not like the Christians were fooled. He, they, they certainly knew what he was talking about. But they could quote him talking about God and not the gods. Because he usually talked about God, but he meant nature, of course. That's uh, Cicero. And Cicero was, as I said, a Stoic. And the Stoics are, would be a very important bridge to study in order to understand natural law in antiquity. And to them, nature was objective reason, the divine element in the universe. And it was by virtue of man's rational power that he could come to understand the reason that is in the universe and live according to it. <coughs> and according to it and according to the laws of nature. So human laws, and this is, was the first time that, that that was said, human laws should approximate as much as possible the laws of nature and the teachings of nature. So this general and stoic point of view is summed up very nicely by Cicero in his discussion of the nature of the law. And the book is the very famous De Legibus, uh, which, is, which means, of course, on laws. And uh, he says, all of these things about which learned men dispute, there is none more important than clearly to understand that we are born for justice and that right is founded not in opinion, but in nature. There is indeed a true law, right reason. Now, he uses this word, this um, expression, right reason, for a true law. Agreeing with nature and diffused among all, unchanging, everlasting, which calls to duty by commanding, deters from wrong to forbidding, by forbidding. It is not allowable to alter this law, nor to deviate from it. Nor can it be abrogated, nor can we released it, released from this law either by the can we be released from this law either by the Senate or by the people. Nor is any person required to explain or interpret it. Nor is is it one law at Rome and another at Athens, one law today and another hereafter. But the same law, everlasting and unchangeable will bind all nations nations and all times, and there will be one common Lord and ruler of all, that is God, the framer and proposer of this law. You can understand how this definition went on into Christianity very well. And of course he meant nature by God, but he used God and gods interchangeably sometimes, you know, like uh, his pain, uh, lip homage to, to, the, to the religion that he was born with but he doesn't really care very much. So the Christian world was very receptive to this concept. And, um, and, and especially because of the idea of the sacred individuality and the uniqueness of every person. And um, Christianity just uh, was pretty much born with the, the idea and the concept of natural law. And one must think of St. Paul, who was probably the first to use the, the expression written on the heart, referring to the law of nature, and, of course, the writer of this law was God. That's uh, very simple to understand. And then you have in the 4th century the, the emperor, Theodosius, and, who ordered the bishop of Milan, who happens to be also the, the, the patron, um, the, the saint patron of Milan, is St. Ambrose, uh, uh, to hand over his cathedral to the empire. That was an order, a decree, he had to do that. And um, San Ambrose told him, by no law you can violate the house of a private man. Do you think that the house of God may be taken away? And then he goes on to curse him, and uh, which, uh, use wor using words I will not repeat. For <laughs> so this episode actually is considered to be the starting point of the millennial struggle of the church and political power. Actually, even longer than that. Uh, and which actually, as uh, Ralph Raker clearly stated, prevented absolute power from arising, thus leaving room for autonomous institutions to develop and to the leaving room for what we call, generally speaking, civil society, but were, was actually markets and associations and um, oath-based relationships, universities like the one in Pavia, which was found as 931, 931, 
pretty amazed. It's never been recognized by Paris and Bologna, but, um, but that's, that's the thing. And it was, it was during the dark times of the Middle Ages, so you had all this, uh, the birth of civil society. But actually, Christian thought is also at the core of our own idea of the individual, whether we are Christians or, or not. Uh, I mean, as long as we are, so, 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 so to speak, Westerners. So clearly, the idea that every person has a soul, and no matter how similar she, look at that, she, may look to any other human beings, she is unique and irreplaceable in the eyes of God, if not of her loved one. Once is really a notion that the classical world never knew and uh, never thought was important at all. You know, it didn't exist in the classical world. That came definitely with Christianity. And actually, I, wanna, I wanted to quote um, a, statement, a statement by Rothbard, which I forgot. Do you get, can you give me one minute because to, to, to show the, the link that there is between natural, modern natural rights theories and this idea, this Christian idea? It's right over there. I'll get it to you. Just, just one second. I forgot the book. I'll give you me third. I'll find it. Uh, we'll be ta- as I said, you know, we'll be we'll be talking about natural rights for quite a while, so I'll find it. But but anyway, it's it's a very Christian idea. <laughs> you're, gonna, you're gonna have to stay yeah, there for four hours. Yeah. Don't move. And so actually uh, it was what what uh, in the works in the works of um, of Thomas Aquinas uh, that we find the best expression of Christian natural law and uh, and uh, his tradition and uh, I will be very quick on that as we do not have much time left but it would deserve certainly a lot of attention and uh, it's been it's been often compared to a cathedral you know his way of thinking you. You have to think that um, Aquinas wrote about 20,000 pages uh, in his own life. And uh, the Summa, his best Smanian Opus, is like 3,000 pages. And uh, everyone, is, it's considered to be like a cathedral, you know. And the pinnacle, definitely, is the natural law doctrine and uh, the idea, certainly, that there is a natural law and that men are bound by it. So, it's um, this Christian notion of natural law is definitely to be found in the Summa, written in the 13th century, as you all know. The greatest Christian philosopher of all times, uh, as uh, as Ralph Raker said, even sanctioned rebellion. I don't know whether, according to him, you could kill or not the tyrant, but but this is what he said. A king who is unfaithful to his duties forfeits his claim to obedience. So, I mean, the first thing you, cause, um, you could do, there, there's no way you can, if he, if he is against uh, divine law or natural law, if he does anything against these laws, then there's no reason to obey him. It is not rebellion to depose him, for he is himself a rebel. So, these, these words are very strong. I mean, and there, there's nothing comparable to it, uh, either in Montana or um, at the time, of course, uh, or anywhere else on earth. And the time during which Thomas wrote was a time of ferment, very good ferment, because previously unavailable works of Aristotle had come to Europe from the Middle East uh, and uh, well, I don't want to sound too biased, but it seems to me like the greatest contribution the Middle East ever made to culture. And, uh, and Thomas actually calls Aristotle the philosopher in the Summa. I mean, he's not like Aristotle, or the greatest philosopher. He's the philosopher. So he's like, when, uh, well, did you know how the Summa works? He just, uh, it's, uh, it's based on questions, you know. And uh, he says, uh, for instance, whether natural... Contingents are subject to the eternal law, fifth article. So this is a question. 
Then he goes, objection one, objection two, objection three. Usually it's three. Sometimes it's four. And, uh, but he, I mean, he doesn't just um, make a mockery out of his adversaries. You know, he just he takes the objections very seriously. And then he says, on the contrary, it is written. And he goes to the sacred scriptures. And then he says, I answer that. And this is the truth, you know, for, according to him. And then he goes on to counter, and he says, reply to objection one, reply to objection two, reply to objection three. And then the argument is made. Now, in the 13th century, this way of reasoning was thought to be pretty good. Scholasticism. I don't know why we abandoned it. I mean, it seems a perfect way, you know, as long as you make a mockery of objections and, and so on. I mean, it would be great to have articles uh, written like this. It would be at least clear. You would know where people would stand and exactly what they're talking about. Usually, I mean, you know, you read articles and there's nothing in it. You cannot come out with a clear thesis or anything. Not that it's only unattainable, but there's none in it. So actually, Thomas, as I said, Thomas, as I said, called Aristotle the philosopher, and not just it, you know, one of those philosophers. And Aquinas' work was intended as a synthesis of philosophy and the Christian faith. But of course, to him, theology was the master and philosophy the servant. Now, for us, it may be difficult to understand this concept, but for Thomas, uh, whose doctrine is also called teleological, that, say, that is to say that it's directed towards an end, uh, all things actually have uh, within themselves, by their very nature, principles which produce actions and direct it to its proper end. So in this sense, it's teleological because... Because, like, there's a man, there's the end for mankind, there's a, the end for every single man, and, and in built in the very nature of man, there are principles which, if accordingly followed, will uh, just lead them to its proper nature and its proper finality, its proper end. So, for, for him, actually, there was, um, there was no contradiction between philosophy and theology, because they both came from God. One was God's written word, and the other one was uh, God implanted reason in the human mind. So there was no contradiction between faith and reason. All this discussion that took place later on about um, the contradictions between faith and reason, of course, uh, good old St. Thomas could not even understand it, could not relate to it. he think we are nuts. And so let me quote for the Summa, from the Summa Theologica. Now, natural law is none other than the concept naturally impressed upon man by which he is guided towards suitable actions in the activities proper to him. So that's really a teleological view of the natural law. And this is the extension to men of the intrinsic finality or tendency to an end that pervades all nature. Every creature has it. The thing is, the other creatures don't, don't think. However, the precepts of natural law are also r rational judgments. So it, it is the light of reason by which we discern that has to be done. What, it is in the, the light, you know, in this light of reason. And, uh, and he calls actually natural law the light of reason in certain places. He calls, it, he calls the natural law this way. And natural law is also an expression of the eternal law. And it is what makes reason the right reason. Why do we know that reason is not wrong and it's really the right reason? Because there is a natural, natural law behind it. And it's also to be found in the Ten Commandments, in the Decalogue. He believes that some of, because, well, man happens to be not only a sinner, but a person who, who tends to err a lot. So God... God gave him the Ten Commandments just uh, to specify certain things. And the Ten Commandments are part of natural law. They're, they're not all the natural law that you can think about, but they're part. They're like, uh, it's like a God helping man, you know, to understand better what he means. And uh, <coughs> so the divine law is given to man as a help to the natural law in this sense. And we can see, we can see a strong parallel with this uh, 
philosophy and theology relationship. So the strong idea is that, that rational creatures, by nature and in consequence of their dignity, have a special position in the ordering of things. In fact, while divine providence governs irrational creatures, of course, and unfortunately we're not talking about um, socialists or social planners and so on, they're considered to be rational creatures anyway, we're just talking about animals, simply animals. But actually creatures who direct their own actions need what he, what he says, the check of law. They need the check of law. However, the positive law conspicuously lacks the universality of the natural law. So its validity depends directly on natural law. And for instance, while natural law says that theft is a crime and also a mortal sin, according to St. Thomas, you know, it says a mortal sin. It's not like, I don't know how this Catholics could go on and saying that robbing people is fine. You know, St. Thomas said it's a mortal thing robbery. Positive law is to decide the punishment. You could hang the guy, cut a couple of hands, do whatever you want with the guy, but that's, that's part of the positive law. And finally, in the Summa, we have uh, the highest conception of natural law, which is defined as the participation of the eternal law in a rational creature. <coughs> that's um, question 91. If you want to take a look at it. So, so it's, part, it's the participation of the eternal law in a rational creature. Because, you know, you have eternal law, divine law, and natural law in that order. In question 91, he talks of the various forms of law. Eternal law, natural law, human law, divine law, and the law of sin. So eternal law is divine providence and the way in which God has fashioned and ordered his creation. In other words, it's like God's plan for mankind. That would be divine law. I'm sorry, humankind. <coughs> and um, so it's, it's her plan for humankind. And um, natural law is the peculiar human participation in eternal law, in that kind of law. So it's like the peculiar human participation in the plan of God. And the plan of God was actually to have man and his greatest creature, supposedly, as a rational animal. And also, according to the philosopher, and according to Aquinas as well, as a social animal. Not a political one, a social. You know, zon politicon could be translated political animal or social animal. The status people tend to translate it as political animal. I'd rather say social, cooperative. The free market is kind of cooperation that uh, certainly Aristotle would have loved. But anyway, natural law is not God's will. Some people at the time thought that it was very simple, that it was God's will. But, you know, like as uh, a lot of scientists would say later, God, God's will couldn't make two and two five. You know, there's no way you could do that. And the same thing actually argued for um, Sam Thomas. So it is not God's will, but it's really God's plan for mankind. And in a certain peculiar sense, it is what we would call freedom. The, the fact that uh, mankind and individual men and women are free to choose whatever they want and their own plans. And now, the last thing I'm going to say is why so many libertarians are at odds or do, like, do not like this this kind of natural law, especially the, the Aquinas version, version of it? Well, first of all, because it's been exploited a lot by communitarians. And so a lot of libertarians didn't read the, the original stuff, and so they believe that, uh, that it's uh, simply communitarian. And it, I mean, communitarian in the sense of McIntyre and that kind of stuff, you know, common, com contemporary thing. <coughs> so he's, well, well, there's one reason for it. He speaks a lot of the, about the common good, and, um, and that's why he's been exploited by the communitarians. However, actually, when he wrote, you have to keep in mind one thing. There was no state. There was nothing like the coercion or a monopoly of coercion that we do know today. There was nothing like that. It was like a, lot, a diffusion of power. So when he was talking about the common good and the, the need we have to cooperate with society and within society, he didn't have in mind taxes or anything like that. He didn't have, have in mind anything like being coerced to do that. He just said that was natural. 
And uh, so Aquinas actually never hinted that one could pursue the common good using coercion or confiscated legitimately owned private property. So cooperation and social bonds are essential to his theory, but so they are for libertarians. And it is my contention that if Thomas were alive, he'd realize immediately how the common good has several friends, among which we can definitely count the free market. And one single enemy, the state. And although the state, uh, or I mean people on behalf of it, used to talk a lot about the common good, uh, the, the, the very concept, the very idea of the state actually has obliterated any notion of natural law and natural order. And I believe that the communitarian exploitation of scholasticism in general, and of Aquinas in particular, is totally misleading. In fact, the greatest medieval philosopher praised community only as he was convinced that it served the individual, that it was in the great interest of the individual to be part of a community. And uh, he was taking the common Aristotelian stand uh, for which only fools, from, from which only fools and knaves can derive a moral duty to robbery that is taxation. Thank you.